Welcome back, everyone. This is the Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stakoviak. This is episode 159, and on today's show, we're talking to Mike Parham, the maker of Sidekick, Sidekick Pro, Inspector, and Inspector Pro. And this is more of a conversation show than we might normally have. Jared, myself, Mike, all talking about sustaining open source. We teetered off the subject a little bit here and there, but for the most part, we were focused on what it takes to sustain open source, avoid burnout, and uh, hopefully you love this show. We have three awesome sponsors, CodeChip, TopTal, and DreamHost. Our first sponsor is CodeChip. They're a hosted, continuous delivery service focused on speed, security, and customizability. You can set up continuous integration in a matter of seconds and automatically deploy your code when your tests have passed. CodeShip supports your GitHub and your Bitbucket projects, and you can get started today with CodeShip's free plan. Should you decide to go with a premium plan, you can save 20% off any plan you choose for three months by using our code, the Changelog Podcast. Again, that code is the Changelog Podcast. That gets you access to a 20% off discount on any plan you choose for three months. Head to CodeShip.com slash the Changelog to get started. Tell them we sent you, and now on to the show. All right, everyone, we're back. Got a great show lineup today. We got Mike Param here today, Jared Santo, of course. Jared, what's up, man? I'm here. I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to do this. You don't sound excited. You got to sound excited. I'm here. I'm excited. I'm ready to do this. Mike, you excited? <laughs> I am pumped, guys. Pumped. <laughs> this is the best part of my day right now. Right. Awesome. Awesome. And it's Friday. You know, it's TGIF. The, the best yeah. day ever. The best day ever. So the conversation today, this is, so for the listener's sake, this is a lot more of a roundtable than I think some of our other shows might be. Uh, a pretty near and dear topic to any of our hearts here. Uh, sustaining open source. Not just sustaining open source, but just sustainable lifestyles. Sustaining anything. The change log, open source projects, a business. And uh, some recent events brought this to Mike's attention. Mike tweeted out uh, that he wanted to talk, and we said, hey, let's talk, and here we are. So what do you think, Mike? Uh, that's a very accurate summary. Very accurate summary. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. sustainable open source, where, what is it that prompted you to tweet what you tweeted? So uh, I tweeted what I tweeted because Steve Klabnik, uh recently sort of rage quit Twitter. And uh, this made me profoundly sad. Uh, I mean, I've met Steve before, a really nice guy, really smart guy. Uh, and he's one of, the, one of the good guys in open source that is not only incredibly productive, but he is, uh, I think, a good role model for, for other people who are, are looking to get into, uh, into open source. And so for him to, to sort of quit uh, open source in, frust- in frustration um, really worried me. And uh, I think it. This, I'm a, I'm assuming that he. I, yeah, I can't really speak to why he quit per se, um, but I know that uh, open source has a serious problem with sustainability, in people working on open source projects for months or years and then giving up on them because they simply don't want to put in any more time into it because it's so frustrating, and so I wanted to have that discussion about. Uh, things that you can do to minimize that frustration and things that you can do to uh, ensure that not only are you treated with the most respect, but your users are treated with respect right. and, and everyone, everybody tries to be uh, as respectful to, to each other as possible. Well, I was going to say, let's, let's maybe as a group try to reflect back on those we can remember or moments we can remember where burnout happened. Besides Steve here, this is the most recent one, but you got things like I'm not sure if why I ever left Ruby because of burnout or not. Um, I, I I think it's sort of up in the air if you if you that's an opinion maybe not so much a fact unless anybody has proof and he said so behind the scenes. Um, Lee Hambly with Capistrano we had a conversation on that um, just recently just yesterday we released a show or recently we re- released a show with uh, uh, I had a conversation with the CEO of Joint Scott Hammond and we talked about. Ryan Dahl having uh, issues with burnout and then stepping away from Node back in the day, and that sort of helped begin some long-term fracturing, not so much uh, 
you know, he himself, but just his departure and, you know, removing himself as the BDFL. And then, you know, what, what, got, what uh, examples can you guys come up with? The one that I uh, can think of offhand was um, James Tucker, who is also known as Roggy. He used to maintain Rack, and he sort of he joined Google, I think, uh, a year or two ago. And he's sort of minimized his open source work over the last two years because he's been so frustrated and um, and feels like he's just putting in a lot of work uh, for maintenance, you know, and drudgery. Um, without any sort of reward or recognition. So uh, I th- I don't know that he is like tweeted out enraged things, but I know he has in the past. I don't necessarily have someone else to add to the list. One, one fine point I wanted to make about uh, Steve's recent departure. Um, as many listeners know, Steve's kind of been involved in the changelog over the years. And so he is in our, our Slack room and he did want to make a point Um, He asked us to say this, if we were going to talk about it, is that um, he says, he had a second, he had a follow-up tweet, which he says, I feel the need to say that this has been a few years coming. If you're just reading my timeline, you probably don't get it. And then he said to us, this is me needing to chill out after years of stuff. It's not any particular thing. So, yeah, just wanted to throw that in there. When you go to, when you get the pedal to the metal and your car goes 120 and you're going 120, I love analogies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't bur- you don't you don't burn out overnight, right? You burn out right. day after day after day for months and years. Um, your your sort of frustration level grows every single day. There's um, the burnout doesn't happen overnight. So maybe we can talk about some things that attribute to it. So there's a couple factors. You got one self inflicting uh, things that you can do, right? The ways you live your lifestyle, the choices you make. And then there's the other side, which is the way the world perceives what you work on, whether it's in recognition or adoration um, or put downs or requiring too much from you and, and treating like a god and expecting more from you than you can actually, you know, put out sustainably for long periods of time. So maybe let's start with the, the ones you do self-inflicting. What, what are some examples I think of that you can think of that are self, self-inflicting towards moving you towards burnout? Well, the easiest, the easiest thing to do is just over, overwhelm yourself with work, is to just keep saying yes to, to, uh, to new features, yes to the growth of your own project that you may be working on. Uh, if you want to build, start building your own language and interpreter, um, that might be a fun weekend project, but if people start using it, if you want to start using it at, at your work, uh, maybe for some you know, custom business purpose, now all of a sudden you've got users, you've got something to maintain. People start adding, ask, asking for more features. Now that weekend project has gone from something that you can throw away to something that other people start to depend on, and that brings up a question of how long, how are you going to support this thing? Yeah, sometimes that um, those responsibilities can can even surprise and overwhelm somebody who never expected their little project to go so far. Um, and all of a sudden now you have all these users at first it's fun. Um, somebody's paying attention to something you built. Of course, that joy of having something you made being used in the real world. Uh, we've all probably felt that and it feels pretty good. And you start to have a certain sense of responsibility that you probably weren't prepared for. And uh, how you react in that moment, or you know, maybe, like you said, it is over time, but how you react to those type of pressures, I think, can lead you, you know, one way or the other. Right. People start seeing you as an expert in that space, whatever that space might be, mm-hmm. and you don't want to lose that respect. And so by telling people no, you might be worried that you're going to start losing that respect. And so a lot of people tend to just start saying yes to everything. They don't want to turn down PRs. They they want to answer every support question as fast as possible. Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a tough it's a tough. Once you have that ball rolling, it's going to roll on its own. That inertia is going to keep going on its own, and it's hard to to stop that. As a as a, I guess an experiment in preparation for this call, I went on Hacker News and searched for burnout. Just the word burnout. 
uh, not a ton of results, but enough to you know alarm anybody. 331 results. I don't know if uh, some of these go back a couple of years. And then I went to the next place. Somebody might rant about burnout or talk about burnout, which is medium. And uh, the list is just way too long to even go through. Like it's just creative burnout, uh, all all angles of burnout talked about on medium. So clearly this happens every day. Clearly people are having this issue and, and clearly it's, it's going to keep happening because that's what the past says in the future, predict, you know, the past predict, predicts the future. So right. if, if some of these things are self-inflicting, what are some of the things that are, are not self-inflicting where the, I guess it's the thing where, you know, we have pride. We're like, okay, great. People love what I've done. I'm thinking, you know, when you guys were talking, I was thinking about Flappy Birds. Like, he didn't expect that game to get crazy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. right? And then what happened to him? He was like, I'm not making games anymore. I, don't, I didn't follow all the drama, but it, it, it broke down to some real serious drama where this game took off, and then he got a lot of hate for the game being too close to Mario Brothers, and then it was just the coolest game ever because no one could win it. And so then it was about trying to win this game, and, and all he was trying to do was just have fun and release something silly to... You know the app store. Nice, yeah, that, nice responsible that, for the game. <laughs> you know that was one of the fastest forms of burnout I've ever seen. I think it was a. Uh... Yeah, where did he last uh, three days? <laughs> it, it was not very long. He pulled the game from the app store, and then that's when everybody got really mad, right? Well, he couldn't take the attention, right? I was telling Jared this too. Like that's one of the concerns I've had with with the change log. Is like I'm not. I'm a. I'm a pretty private person. I like to share what I do in my life, but there's certain lines I don't cross. Not because nobody deserves to know or I'm, I got some secrets. It's just that there's things that are private and there's things that are public. And I didn't want the success required of the change log to sustain it, require me to become more and more of a celebrity, which I don't desire, or Jared to become more and more of a celebrity so that when we go places, people know us. That's nice, but I don't want it to be like, well, phew. The change log's got to exist forever. You know, it's got to be the greatest show every time we do it. <laughs> and then you got like this mountain that sort of like starts, mount, you know, mounting up against you. And you're like, I can't live up against that. So do you have that problem, Mike? With your work? Uh... Celebrity status, people expecting like the greatest thing ever from you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think I have that too much. And I try not to. I try not to lead people into thinking that, you know, my way is the best way ever. I, I, I try to make it clear that what I build, here's what it's designed to do. Um, you know, it may suit your purpose or, or it may not. Um, I, I do have a little, little bit of the celebrity thing in that when I get, like when I went to RailsConf last month, um, it was ridiculous because a lot of people knew me and I know nobody, right? So, um, for instance, I, you know, I'd just be talking to a bunch of, a bunch of people at the happy hour or whatever, and they'd say, Hey, what do you do? And I say, well, I, I wrote sidekick. I maintain sidekick as my, my full-time job now. And all of a sudden these guys want to get a photo with me because they uh-huh. use sidekick. They love sidekick yeah. and well, they cool. can't believe that they just met me. And you know, I, so I, I don't know any of these guys like, but they all know me. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the definition of a celebrity where people, um, people just already know who you are. <laughs> There's no introduction sort of necessary aside from just acknowledging, yeah, that's me. Right. Um, but, uh, what was I going to say? We were, we were talking about Flappy Bird and I had something to mention and, <laughs> and I lost track. Well, I'll throw one thing in there and you can think about that for a second. I, I've gotten it where I was standing in line for a drink at a pre-party or after party to conference and I'm talking to somebody and somebody turns around, they're like, Hey, are you Adam stack? You know, they don't even call me by my name. They call me by my, like my internet hand or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they didn't know me, but by what I was talking about, they knew me by my voice. And I was like, that's me. You know, like, what am I going to say? No, <laughs> it's somebody, you know, but, it, but yeah, I've had something similar and my wife was with me and she was sort of freaked out by it. Not, not in a bad way. But she was like, it really is Googleable. <laughs> that's that's a long story short, Jared. You might be able to laugh at that because we told you the story before. But when I, I know a longer version, yeah, I embarrassed myself by saying when I first met my wife, um, one of the things I said to her, and depending on how you take it, it could be it could be thinking like I was trying to like say I was cool, but I wasn't. I meant that I was trustworthy. That 
anything you want to find out about me is on Google. So I said, I'm highly Googleable. You go on Google, you can find out pretty much the kind of person I am by the links that link back to what the internet says I am. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can realize that I'm not this jerk. So, right. Uh, anyways, sidetrack. Yeah, I'll just say one more point around the celebrity thing, and then maybe we can put this this to bed and, and talk about sustainability. I think Mike has some good ideas around it, but uh, internet celebrity is is different, right? And I think it's better in the in the terms of, of overall celebrity. Of course, you're not on. Uh, the network news, or well, actually, you're usually, if you're on the network news, you're in trouble. Uh, you're not on uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, entertainment tonight and whatnot. But those celebrities, they can't escape it. Like, you, you can't, like, when you reach a certain level of people knowing you and you're not knowing them, there's no privacy for you anymore. You can't actually get away from it. And uh, internet famous, uh, you, you can always just, you're always normal in the real world. Like, you know, when you, Unless you're at RailsConf, right? right. Like I, I assume when you go to your local Apple <laughs> right. store or Target, people aren't saying, "Hey, it's Mike Parham. I use Sidekick." People Sidekick, right? get right. him, yeah. right? Um, so it's nice in the sense of you know it, RailsConf, perhaps it'll be even more enjoyable for you because you meet people who enjoy your work. Um, that can become overwhelming, and then what we do in response to that, because we can, is we just leave the internet because that's where right. the pressure is, right? And it's a nice, it's actually grace for us that we can't, we can, we can just leave the internet and we're okay. But that being said, you leave all of us behind who, uh, who adore the work that you do on the internet. And so it and we feel abandoned being right. a, a loss for the community, but necessary for the person who, uh, is leaving. Very true. Um, but, but to move to something, Wait, Mike, Mike you said did you think about okay. your thing, Mike? Uh no no I, you I could get your point it's, okay. long, it's long gone you want to do the, that, yeah. the sponsor break real quick Jared then come back sure what's uh, what's the next topic what do you want to bring up well uh, something Mike said earlier a pre call which I think we should talk about is goals right and I think that's a major linchpin for um, gauging success and failure and you know whether or not you can sustain something good deal well, all right let's let's take a break we'll come back and we'll talk about what Jared just said and uh we'll be right back. You've heard me talk about Top Towel several times on this podcast, but today is different. I've got a special treat for you. I went out and spoke with a listener who a year ago had never heard of Top Towel. He listened to the show just like you're doing right here, right now today, and heard us talk about Top Towel and what they're all about, and he decided to get in touch. And now he's living the dream as a freelance software developer with Top Towel. His name is Daniel Elzon, and I sat down and I talked with him. I said, hey, what is it that you love most about TopTal? Take a listen. Well, for me, the, the thing about TopTal, which I thought would be very hard for me personally as I transitioned to a more consulting role, uh, was the, the way I would have access to new clients and what quality of those would be. So I found that I've had access to awesome clients through TopTal, and it hasn't been that hard to find because they have a lot of choice. And even more than that, uh, there's enough choice and I, I can actually be a little selective about what kinds of things I want to be working on. So I use that as a way to sort of hone my skills and, you know, go towards the technology that I think are, are worth investing in for the future. So whether it's, you know, including new front end frameworks or doing a little DevOps work on the side, I, I, I usually am able to find clients who are, uh, have the needs of the things I want to get better at. So that's been, that's been uh, truly useful. All right, that was Daniel Lazan, a listener of the Change Log, and also a freelance software developer with TopTal. If you want to follow in Daniel's footsteps, go to toptal.com slash developers. That's T-O-P-T-A-L dot com slash developers to learn more about what TopTal is all about and tell them the Change Log sent you. All right, we're back. We're talking about how can you sustain open source projects we're here with Mike Para. Mike has a few ideas, and one of those is around goals. Can you speak to that, Mike? Sure. I think um, a lot of burnout comes from the fact that uh, you, you as a, a developer or as an engineer, just don't see the light at the end of the tunnel for your project. Uh, you don't necessarily see where you're going and when you're going to achieve that goal. And so setting some realistic goals for your, for your project, uh, like what you want to happen, uh, 
based on all the input and all the work that you're doing on the project can really help uh, because you're not, you don't see it as an endless time suck anymore. You see it as the work that you need to do to get to some point at the end of, but you see the light at the end of the tunnel. So um, a lot of people, when they create an open source project, they just say, um, I want to create this thing and then I want people to use it. Uh, but, But the problem with that is that that becomes an endless time sink where people may be using this thing for the next, for five years from now. Are you going to be around five years from now to support it? And uh, if you if you acknowledge that, yes, I'm going to be around five years from now, that's fine. That actually helps your mental attitude so that you understand that uh, I'm going to do what I need to do to reach that goal of supporting it five years from now. But if you don't have those goals in mind, you can you can easily be overwhelmed psychologically and just all that you have to do. And it just keeps piling up. Um, and you're not really seeing any any uh, positive outcome uh, for all the, the input that you're putting into the project. So the thing I think is what you get by doing that is something Matt Vasquez taught me. When I started working at Pure Charity with Matt, um, it, it, Jared, do you know Matt Vasquez? Any, any of you guys know Matt by any chance? No, I don't think so. Hmm. Um, no. Super smart guy. Um, I think he's – it's called – Scrummage is is the app he's making. Get Scrummage, I believe, is the URL. If it's not, Scrummage might lead you to his actual project. But he worked with me at Pure Charity, lead dev, uh, turned CTO, I think, at some point. I'm not sure if he was actually CTO or not. But nonetheless, he was the person in charge of the development team. But I learned so much from Matt about setting expectations. I used to get angry at people for not for not delivering what I thought they should deliver. And he would say, well, did you set some goals for them, right? So what you just said, Mike, setting goals for yourself or for other people, it it sets expectations. If I do this, I can expect, you know, to come close to this result or, or not, but that's what I'm expecting to do. And because you set the expectation clearly enough, it's easy to have a waypoint or, you know, like a positive or negative emotional response to where you're actually trying to go. And for me, right. that was everything it was like setting expectations for me and for others has been huge. So anytime right. I feel angry at somebody, I'm like I, I, internally before I get mad at them and, and say lash back, which I never lash back at anybody. But let's, you know, my own version of lashing back. I ask myself, did you set expectations well enough for them? If not, you're wrong. Right. So how 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 explicitly do you set expectations? Then I mean, you like make a list, or you. Well, I mean, you know, you know, use your own judgment. But like, for for example, uh, I'll use this example, and and not because it's a, a real issue whatsoever, but only because it's the most relevant issue or the most relevant point I can make. Today we release a show. Every Friday we release a show. Right now, if 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 it had gotten to, you know end of Thursday night and end of Friday morning and Aaron hadn't finished the, the file or finished the edit, then right. Then, then I would say to myself, well, it's in Aaron's court. He's the last person to touch the next step for this project to go out. And I would say to myself, if it isn't completed or done, did I tell him what needed to be done? Is it clear what his next step should be? And if that were the case, then I have reason to say, well, he's got an issue. But if the ball's in my court and I didn't set expectations clearly enough, then it's my fault, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's what I mean by that. So like if if it's clear that what the next step should be and they have onus of it, then then that to me is clear enough expectations. Gotcha. But Aaron, you're awesome, dude. There's you're just a, <laughs> just a good example to share. And I'm just saying that. That's all. It's a good example. And we shipped. We shipped it first thing this morning. Yeah, I mean, so, it, was, yeah. it was awesome. Everybody loves the show. It's great. <laughs> and, and expectations are are something that uh, you're gonna. I, I think that that's a great point, Adam. You're gonna use it anytime you interact with people on your open source project. Uh, even a PR PR feedback is setting an expectation, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's here's the three things that I don't like about this PR that need to get worked uh, get worked on. You're setting the expectation that I'm I'm not going to accept this PR until this uh, these issues are dealt with, yeah. and that that just makes everybody happier. That way, the the PR is not sitting there in limbo, uh, and the the person who sent the PR understands that they're going to have to put a little more work into it, right? Uh, if they want it to get, to be accepted, right? If a code review is required for a PR to be accepted, which is pretty much every PR, 
and it has been done, and the the PR isn't accepted yet, it's clear why it's not accepted. Somebody right. hasn't reviewed the code. Nobody right. plus one did. The community hasn't approved it, and that's why it's where it's at. And then you flip you flip that to someone setting their goals. Now, since Steve is is your example, we'll use him. Like if he set his expectations, which he has with this recent uh, uh, rage tweet that he's he's put out to to step away for a bit. He's made it clear, like, hey, this is what you expect from me. I'm going to be on GitHub. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be there. But I'm not going to be on Twitter. I'm not going to be on Hacker News. So if you call, I'm not answering. Now the expectation is set clearly. Now later on when he comes back and he's revived himself and he's got clarity on his next steps and he can set some more expectations saying, hey, I'm back. Um, or it's another good example. Ryan Bates, right? We engaged Ryan Bates. We said, hey, dude, mm-hmm. so glad you're back. We sent him a DM. We were trying our best to be not too excited that he was back to push him back into the corner again. We want to say, hey, we missed you. We appreciate the work you've done. Whenever you're ready, the door's open. Give us a shout. We'll be here. We'd love to talk to you on the show, whatever. And he set up expectations. I'm only on Twitter for now. I'm just kind of lurking here and there. I'll engage as I can. But for the most part, this is what you can expect from me. And I think that expectation is both for people, um, you know, engaging you as well as what you expect from yourself. Right. Yeah, actually that's, that's a, that's a, another good point. The, uh, when you start an open source project, not only do you set your own expectations about what the project uh, is going to do, but you all, you should also list in your readme what users should expect from you. You know, uh, yes, the MIT and the BSD license says this code is not fit for any purpose. Don't expect it to be. That's setting expectations legally that you cannot hold the developer uh, legally liable for any any issues. Uh, in the same way, you should set, say in your readme, I'm not going to support this thing. You know, period. Yeah. Yep. Or if you want support, you have to buy an enterprise license at this URL. That's right. it. Or and say, that way, not that accepting way... pull requests. For <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's a legitimate thing to say in your readme. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, and, and as long as you set expectations and uh, before people start using it, they're gonna they're gonna be happy about that because then they can decide: Do I want to use this thing based on these expectations I should have? You know, if you say I'm not going to support this, maybe a business would say, "Then we're not going to use it." That's fine. It's a perfectly acceptable, uh, you know, thing to do. Uh, but it also means that you don't have to be supporting it for years to come. <laughs> Well, we talked about sustainability, uh, goal setting, expectation. Um, Mike, you mentioned in the pre-call the care factor. Can you talk a bit about what you meant by that? Sure. Uh, I think to some amount, more or less, all engineers who work on open source uh, take pride in what they've built. And they see sort of any uh, any positive uh, feedback on it as a point of pride, but any negative feedback as, um, you know, like you're taking one on the chin, you know, you take it a little bit personal when somebody says this thing is junk or this thing is broken. It just doesn't work. Um, when you, when you spend a lot of time building something for free, uh, you, that's a, that's altruism that you're giving to the world and, and then to be lashed for it, to be, to be lashed out or to be maligned because of a mistake or something like that. It hurts. It hurts a lot. I wish people were more kind period. I just really do wish people were more kind. People feel so much entitlement sometimes, you know, especially when it comes to open source, like, Hey, you put this out there. You yeah. should expect to support this thing. What, what are you thinking? Mm-hmm. I you think know? a lot, I think everyone wants to be a nice guy or everyone wants to be a nice person. Everyone wants to be seen as uh, a positive, but a lot of people get frustrated and they lash out mm. without thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have that internet skill of writing something, deleting it, walking away, and then writing it again 24 hours later. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll tweet because they're enraged or they'll, they'll write a GitHub comment uh, on an issue that they just discovered that cost them three hours this weekend. And they'll say, this just cost me three hours and it's such a huge pain in the butt. Why, you know, kill yourself. Yeah. 
and and they're they're super frustrated. Yeah. Um, but you're right that there is a sense of entitlement to uh, to insulting somebody like that. But again, it's it's faceless communication. We're not talking to each other face to face, so it's so easy to uh, to let up to get a, a flame war. Started. Oh yeah, I mean, text is. I would just downright say it. It's okay. I'll say it. It's impossible to understand whether or not you're trying to be nice or try to be mean or even malicious because you can't see body language. You can't see, you can't hear tone in the voice. Right. All the things we use as waypoints to determine whether or not Mike's trying to be a jerk to me are gone when it's in text. The only right. thing that sort of adds it back lately is an emoji. But the other day I got a thumbs up after something and I was like, is that like shoving it up my, or is it like, <laughs> is it like really a thumbs up, man? Like, and I had to like back away from it and not, and it was a, a little thing, and I shared it. Like a I sarcastic sh- smiley face? Yeah, like, Is that yeah. a legitimate smiley face, or is that a sarcastic smiley face? And I shared my negative concern with my wife, and she's like, Adam, chill out. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, that's the way to burn out, man. You, sh- yeah. you got to think, the, you gotta, you gotta think the, the best of people, right? If it's unclear which one it is, just assume the best yeah. of yes. people. Well, and, and one thing that, that we way... don't think about is, uh, sorry, Mike, the one thing we don't think about uh, oftentimes when we're on the receiving end of a flame, right, is what's going on in that other person's life. Yes. Like what truth. brought them to that point right? Uh, to where they say something that's incredibly offensive to me or attacking me. And, you know, we don't know about uh, that pressure they have at work or uh, their spouse who's in the hospital, right, or that bill that's, you know, three months late. Yeah. Whatever knows? it is that's like bringing them to a point of uh, lashing out. You know, we we assume that they're just a jerk, right? Right. And uh, maybe legitimately so in certain cases, um, but we tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and nobody else. And on both sides of that, in the internet, it's just bad news. That is absolutely right. I I always think of it like um, I don't know when it changed for me, but it, it, I can remember clearly that something in me changed that whenever I would go to let's say a convenience store to get gas and it's before the days where you can pay at the pump. Right. So this is back in the day. Um, you know, and, and I go into the convenience store and I go to pay and then maybe I get some gum and I get a Snickers. Cause I love Snickers. Who doesn't love Snickers? Right. Uh-huh. Snickers. Always satisfies. That's right. <laughs> right. This is not an advertisement. This is Snickers. not an advertisement for Snickers, but I love Snickers. <laughs> That's a free, right. free ad. It, Snickers. If you would like to sponsor the change log, we'll definitely consider uh, folks. Please pause that. the podcast right now and go buy a Snickers. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Get yourself a Snickers. And when you buy the Snickers, be nice, be nice to the person behind the, ca- uh, the counter. You know, you never have any idea. Like, uh, I always like to say hello to the person. They they wear their name tag for a reason. If their name is Ben and it says Ben on their on their name tag, hey Ben, how are you? Be polite to people. And and I always think of it like the point I'm trying to make here is that you know I don't know that person. They don't know me, but I get you know thirty seconds of their life, and they're working and they got to deal with the the public. Say say polite things like hello, how are you? Good to see you. You know whatever it is. Because you never know, that person may be dealing with what Jerry was just saying, like a, maybe a bad bill or you know their boss is going to fire them. This is their last shift. Who knows? And you may not be the reason they do it, but you may help enforce their negative attitude to go home and kill their wife or, their, you know, or do something crazy that just shouldn't be done because you could have controlled yourself better or been a more polite social human being and just said hello and use their real name, not just like, uh, stick of gum, Snickers. Here's my card. Bye. You know, be right. be a little generous with with your love, and mm. give some love to people. Yeah, and you just got to try extra hard on the internet because, we, like you said, we don't have yeah. those other forms of communication that you have in real life, right? With the eyes and the the body language, and so we have to be extra. You have to take special care with how we craft our sentences. And like Mike said, you know, take that that one you put together sometimes i'll just stop and reread a few times and say how could this possibly be misconstrued right like could this which is either a joke or uh just constructive criticism or feedback which is something that is valuable how could this be taken wrongly and try to try your best to you know improve your communications um there's a lot of really heated debates though on the internet too and those get going real fast like i don't want to bring up any particular topic, but some, some that have been there lately in the news has been inclusivity 
gender bias, uh, uh, feminism where men aren't treating women well, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of these issues, and they escalate so quickly because there's some inherent pain and inherent hurt from previous engagements around the scenario, around the topic. Yeah. And somebody might indirectly take all the pressure and all the pain that someone's built up, not saying it's wrong or right, not saying that that, that they're not deserving of that feeling. But sometimes mm-hmm. we also get, you know, just like, I just lay it all on Mike. Hey, Mike, you're taking it all, you know, because you're here today. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's not right either. Well, that's interesting. You're talking about the, the the flame wars that come in. People are so passionate about certain topics and it's because they identify one way or the other they identify themselves with i'm this or right. i'm that right it's a and tribal we, response it yeah. is and in software we we identify with our code and i know there's even been conversations back and forth about whether or not you are your code and and these types of things um one kind of shining anti-example to burnout is a recent guest daniel stenberg yes that's the true seven, the show we did on 17 years of curl uh, which everybody enjoyed. I actually went back and re-listened to that show, and he he's just a very interesting person. Um, he said some things like, I enjoy working on Curl now more than I did when I started. And, uh, you know, he's been doing it at least two hours a day, roughly, for, for 17 years. So you know, I started thinking, like, why? How, how did Daniel uh, make it so far? And one of the things he said is, he said, this is my life's hobby. Like, Curl is me. And he identifies like curl is like his life's hobby. And so he has a level of dedication and identity wrapped up in that project that I think, um, you know, you could say maybe is or is not healthy at certain times, but uh, has allowed him to sustain through all the pressure and all the times where he doesn't want to be coding and what have you. And I think that's just an interesting uh, data point. What do you guys think about that? I li- I like the fact that he calls it his hobby. Yeah. And not his life's work. Yeah. Um that that is a sort of an implicit sort of end goal that he's setting there, which is that I'm not going to support myself through this. Mm-hmm. Um it it is a hobby and I'm going to treat it as such, which you know, sort of implies a level of support and a level of activity that can fit into an hour or two a day and not uh, eight hours a day. One other thing he did too, um, just indirectly um, is, or not explicitly is focused, right? He doesn't have curl plus 10 other things he's known for curl. And I guess subsequently lib curl, but it's sort of the same, same camp, you know? Right. So he's, he's got a level of focus too, where he hasn't spread himself too thin and then maybe that's some self-identification of like where his strengths and weaknesses are. Maybe he's not okay with multitasking and working on 10 things at once. Maybe he's okay with full-time employment that's enjoyable and his lifetime hobby. And right. so something I learned from doing Founders Talk for years, the, like if anybody asked me, hey, Adam, you interviewed all these founders of these companies that you know do great things. What's, the, what's like some things you took away? The number one thing I took away was focus. Every one of them focused on their goals. They set some goals and they focused. They didn't do 10 things at once. They didn't do 15 things at once. They, they set some goals and expectations and ran towards those expectations. And as they got closer and closer to them, self-analyzed, am I closer or further away? What's bringing me closer or further away? And took the necessary steps to correct their course towards their goals and focused. And I think Daniel probably has done that based on 17 years of curl. It's crazy. Yeah. Mike, interesting to hear um, maybe your thoughts on that in light of inspector and the fact that, you know, you had sidekick and it's not just your life's hobby, right? This is actually Mm -hmm. how you uh, make a living. You had sidekick, you added inspector. I think it was maybe six or eight months ago. Um, Has that changed your focus? Have you been able to handle uh, two projects at once or uh, how's that going? Right. So, yeah, I mean, once I started sidekick full time, then, you know, when I was supporting Sidekick in my spare time, it was taking a lot of my spare time. Once I had, once I was doing it full time, then I realized, well, this isn't taking eight hours a day. Maybe it's only taking four hours a day. So I did have a little bit of, of bandwidth to support a second product. Mm. So I started building Inspector. And, um, and you're, you're absolutely right. It was six or eight months ago, something like that. In October is when I released it. Um, 
but just I also did it as a way of diversifying. I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who knows how Sidekick will do in the future. Uh, so I thought, eh, well, let's build a second product and see what see what happens. So I've done that. Um, in practice, though, Inspector has not taken a lot of support time. It's mm-hmm. still Sidekick that that dominates my my time. So and and Sidekick also dominates my income. So I've refocused on Sidekick, and I am working on prototyping uh, some new functionality in in the Sidekick space that I will be hopefully releasing sometime this summer. Hmm. We'll, well see. Just to get a little bit technical for a little bit for a minute here. Mm-hmm. Uh, interested why uh, why you think Sidekick uh, dominates your time? Is it the threading is it uh you know ruby versus go or or just because you have so many more people using it uh i think there's a lot more people using it i think inspector will uh slowly rise in users over time uh but it's not a it's not a grand slam hit like sort of sidekick just sort of took off Uh um and also uh sidekick is just inherently a lot more complex it's a framework so your code is running within sidekick Whereas Inspector is kind of like this black box. You configure it, set it up on your machine, and it just runs. Right. So uh, Sidekick is just inherently a, a lot more complex and, and doing a lot more things. So when you started Sidekick, did you did you follow the advice that you now have? Did you have set goals, and did you have expectations that you followed up? Well, I had one explicit goal, and that was I did not want to work for free for the rest of my life supporting this thing. Hmm. I wanted to come up with a way of supporting myself and paying myself for the hours that I was spending on it. Now, what that pay was going to be, I wasn't sure. I didn't know if I was going to make a dollar an hour <laughs> or, uh, you know, a thousand dollars an hour. So uh, I started I started Sidekick with the aim of trying to figure out some sort of business model for it because I knew it was a, it was a valuable thing. It was uh, it was going to be my plan was to make the best background job system, bar none, and uh, and make it a lot more efficient than the current systems that were out there. So there's inherent value in that. Instead of needing to run ten machines, now you only need to run one machine. That saves that actually saves the business a lot of money. So there's there's some uh-huh. value right there. <clears throat> so I I had to play with the various business models for you know the first year of Sidekick's existence. But uh, once I hit upon Sidekick Pro and released it, um, the sales immediately took off, and I wasn't self-sufficient in the first year. But within, I think, two years after I released Sidekick Pro, I was making more off of it than I was making off of my full-time job. And so there was no point in working for somebody else to build their dream Right. When I've got my own dream, which is scaling up in sales over time, why not work on that full time and uh, and do my own thing? And so that's what I've been doing for the last year. But uh, but it does go back to having an end goal, which is if I'm going to put a lot of time into this thing, I want it to support me. If I'm going to support you, you need to support me, so to speak, right? Yeah. So so that's why I I offer the the free version and the paid version. And a lot of businesses have said, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Let's buy this thing. We want to guarantee support years from now. And uh, and this is a very easy way to just bring out a credit card and, and, and do it. And in the past, Mike, you talked about um, – in the past show, I'm trying to remember what, uh, what you mentioned about that, was, was basically determining what you would allow in the pro version to come back into the open source version. So if, if – you're a listener right now, and you're thinking, I got that question. Go back and listen to the last show. Jared, did you have the episode number that Mike was on last time? I'll grab it. Can you find that? Because yep. one thing that Mike, what you said was, um, was you, you kind of drew the line where Pro would overlap with uh, the open source version and what you would allow coming back in, because obviously someone could fork it and add the same feature that you had in the Pro version mm-hmm. to the open source version. But we talked about you know whether or not you'd accept that pull request and what to do right. that. So you know, realistically, the features that I've put into Pro, with maybe one or two exceptions, are so complicated that I would I would seriously doubt that 
Someone would just, <laughs> would just about sort of too. randomly randomly build an open source version of it. Just pay Mike to, to, to build it and support it. I mean, it, right? It, it really is that simple. <laughs> um, I it know really it sounds, is that simple. Yeah, I know it, I it like sounds point, dumb. Mike. That's but, good. But remember, with the with open source, it, pe- people are, are terrible at estimating how long this is going to take them to build. Mm. And so I was talking with a guy just today, just this morning, on Stack Overflow, who who said, how do I know when my set of jobs are all done? And I said, well, that's Sidekick Pro's batches option. And he was like, well, can I just implement some counters and Redis and uh, and just sort of build it myself. And I'm thinking, and I, and I told him up front, I was like, you can absolutely do that. It will work 90% of the time. And um, the other 10% of the time, the other 5% of the time, you'll have no way of figuring out what's going wrong. Um, it, it will just, it'll be a time suck. And, you know, if you're a business, you're trying to solve a business problem. Why are you building Sidekicks Pros batches feature again? Right, right. That's setting expectations back to that same thing we did. Like, hey, you can do that, but if you just support me and support me through buying the pro version, you can have a happy life, not the time suck. And there's the expectation. So that's back to the right. sustainability of that's how you make your money. Right. To I'm sure you got family right mike you got wife kids yep Yep. a wife and a kid right so you got things to take care of and and you're doing work and you're being altruistic and putting things out there in the open source world but you're also putting a pro version out there that says hey here's a i've thought of the feature it's really complex you don't want to deal with it and if you support me you can get that here and support with it i think that's historically a hard sell for developers because we yeah. build solutions, you know, at the, for Every a day. living. Yeah. And it's like, I'll well. I'll build my own. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's in there, right? Like, I, I think that all, I have to stop myself often. I, I love how, as developers, I think we're becoming more business savvy uh, just as an industry over time. And uh, and yet, I still have to stop myself and say, why am I hand rolling this solution, you know, which may take me 10 hours at, you know, this cost to my customer or what have you. When I know that the solution I saw it, it was twenty bucks a month, right, <laughs> or whatever it is, right. and yet I'm like, well, that's too much. I'll just spend a thousand dollars building it. That's gonna work ninety ninety percent of the time. All, right. all I want is a folder of files on all my machines. How hard could that possibly be? Yeah, and yet exactly. you've got people paying Dropbox billions of dollars to provide mm-hmm. that same functionality. You know, you, nerds will buy a, a network attached storage system. They'll set up an NFS mount. They'll do all this complex <laughs> complexity. Open up an provide, IP back to their house so that yeah, just away. provide a folder, all that a file. Yeah. But the reality Which, is that ninety nine percent of businesses don't want to deal with that, so they will pay yeah. for the pro version. So if somebody wants to build the batch or reliability or whatever the different pro features are, someone wants to build that and release it themselves, they can totally do that. I don't. I don't care. It's you are free to write whatever code you want. Mm-hmm. Um, the the question though is are you going to be around three years from now to support that code? Mm. Are you going to support it as Sidekick yep. changes over time? That's um, true. So you know businesses aren't just paying for a feature; they're also paying so that they can they know that someone is going to be there to answer questions, to deal with migration well, and businesses and, and people though. I mean, because businesses pay for things, but people pay for things with their choices, right? Sure. So when they choose to use Sidekick. They're they're choosing to you know follow you in a trusted way. You're not going to go anywhere, and they can even trust you more because you do have a business model that is sustainable to the point where you can long term support the open source version. Right. You know, I mean, in terms of not so much, hey, you got a problem, here's how you fix it, but you know, right. you're making sure that if things break or if there's something that goes wrong with it, you're there to fix the open source version of it and re-release it because you've got a sustainable model. Right. So, so to bring the conversation back to the topic at hand, which is <laughs> burnout. Yes. Um, I knew that when I started Sidekick that this was a big enough project and my aim was to make it successful enough to where if I didn't have some way of paying myself to support myself in doing the project, that I was going to burn out. There's no way I could support Sidekick as well as I do today without having it be sort of a, a job that is paying me money. And, and so that's how I dealt with burnout is I turned it into a job. And now I'm happy to devote eight hours a day to supporting Sidekick um, because I know that it's my, my full-time job and it's supporting my life. 
Um, so, so that that goes back to those setting expectations of, hey, my goal here is to not just develop another open source project. It's also to develop a business and possibly a life around this work. Yeah. So that's, I guess, where I deviated from what Daniel did with Curl. Uh-huh. He made it his life's hobby. I want to make it my. I want to make Sidekick my life's work. Hmm. I wonder if he could make Curl uh, some sort of pay model. I imagine, right, Jared? Because he says he's got Facebook and all these gigantic companies using it. He's got to. They got to have features that that uh, they need to pay for. Think about that, Daniel. Get back to us. <laughs> well, I know <laughs> he has listening. had. I know he has had paid opportunities to work on it, which yeah. gets him very excited. Um, like to add right now, he's adding some stuff to HTTP two. Uh, some some additional HTTP two support, like on a contract type of deal. So he has had opportunities where it has made him some money, but because he's in his mind, it was still that hobby. It's not all of a sudden now he expects it to make money because if he did, you know, he may de- be down at that one dollar an hour rate, or, you know, and he can right. he can make a lot more than that working full time yeah. for Mozilla. Um, for those of you who are interested in the full story on uh, Inspector and Sidekick, uh, check out changelog.com slash one thirty. Nice. Where Mike and us go deep into those topics. Let's take a break, hear from a sponsor, and we'll be back in a bit. DreamHost now has managed VPS hosting built for speed and scalability, including solid state drives, and that's awesome. These VPSs are built for open source developers and now include one click installs of Node.js, custom Ruby, and RVM support. Speed, speed, and more speed is what it's all about. Their VPS servers use SSD hard drives and are 20% faster than traditional SATA drives. All virtual private servers from DreamHost include SSD storage, Ubuntu 12.04 LTS, web-based control panel, scalable RAM, which is super awesome. You can go from 1 gig of RAM and easily scale up to 8 gigs if you need it. Node.js one-click install, Ruby version manager, unlimited bandwidth, unlimited hosted domains, unlimited 24-7 support, Go check them out and learn more at dreamhost.com slash the changelog. All right, we're back. It was a fun break. Um. (laughs) The funnest. Yeah, that was the best break ever. (laughs) It was the best break ever. (laughs) No, it really was a good break, and now we're here to talk about moderation. So we've talked about lots of different things, and moderation could have been in some of that that conversation, but directly speaking, like what kind of what kind of things have you done personally to like practice moderation in your work? Uh, well, moderation. We all know that burnout happens faster the more you the more you push yourself into something. Right? Um, if you spend twelve hours a day working on something, it's it's very easy to get burnt out very quickly. Uh, so I tend to think of moderation as a way of, of pushing back burnout, um, of easing up on the gas, so to speak, to use that that car analogy, so that um, you're not going 100 miles an hour, uh, but you get a chance to to do other things in your life and and sort of you know change mental gears. That that always uh, helps with the burnout. So moderation uh, is all about you know spending an hour or two a day and not four, six, eight hours a day, especially if you are got a full-time job working in software, where then you go home and then you work with software for another four or six hours. Mm. Uh, you know, that's a recipe for burning out really quick. Uh, Lord knows. And many people do that. Lord, yeah. Lord knows computers can be frustrating. So, um, you know, also that's the city position too. Like you think about the moderation on the brain, but on your body, you know, if you study, sure. So Jared, I know you stand, Mike, do you sit or stand? I sit, um, but I, I also exercise a fair amount. Um, so I, I run. You're I, a runner. I, That's right. I know I, you are. I, I climb. Um, I, uh, what else do I do? Push-ups. Do you so, yeah, I'm, I'm, throughout, I'm generally throughout the day or at the weekends and stuff like that, like throughout <clears> your day? I usually do one of those a day. So mm-hmm. uh, before the call here, I ran for 30 minutes. Cool. Nice. Um, and then yesterday I was at the climbing gym climbing. So... And then the day before that, I was out racing my motorcycle around the racetrack. So, right. weren't you? You worked at the climb, right? That was mm-hmm. that, okay. I'm. We had so many guests on. I'm trying to remember who was it. That, so, and that was all about being active and outdoors and stuff like that. So, exactly, exactly. Um, so, so I, I definitely fit into the brand there. Yeah, yeah. 
That's that, that's another thing. I mean, I think you can try to stand. You can minimize some things to sure. step into moderating what it is you do with your body. But yeah, if you are the person who's working ten hour days and then going home and working on open source and you're sitting fourteen hours a day and then you're sleeping, you never really give your your back or body a chance to sort of stretch out and right. and just be a more healthy body human being. Like people think their mind, I'm probably hijacking what you're trying to talk about, Mike, but (laughs) I'm just thinking out out loud here. Like people only think about, especially intellectual people, they think, Oh, I got a good mind. They forget about their body. They forget to eat right. They forget to, you know, go to the gym or just not so much to be like a a fitness nut, but just to move your freaking body. And I'm actually going through this myself because I'm, I was in that space where I, you know, probably was a bit, you know, too into the intellectual side of, you know, moderating my lifestyle. And now I've realized that I've got to balance things out. I've got to make time to go to the gym, you know, several times a week. I've got to make time to do these different things and I got to eat right. Cause if not, geez, I mean, I can get sick and I don't know if, if you guys know this fellow, but, um, Ian Warshak, does that name ring a bell to either of you? Yeah. He's a friend of mine. Okay. So, you know, his story, Ian, yeah. uh, you know, love the guy. But uh, a, a real quick snapshot, he, he was probably living a good lifestyle, and I'm not sure what the situation was that, that made him get so ill, but he'd gotten so so quickly, he'd gotten a cold and, and went to the hospital, and before you knew it, it was severe, it was serious. And he was um, just like you and I, all of our limbs, all of our fingers, and he came down with a sickness. I'm not sure if it was because of moderation, so I'm not trying to place that on him, but it's it's uh, it's something that can happen to every one of us where in a moment's notice your body can can turn on you your body cannot react away and even your brain too with alzheimer's and different diseases so i think moderation isn't just in what we do with our lives you know or what we do with our day-to-day coding habits but also just how we play out our lives and just to wrap up uh ian's story uh he, he ended up losing his hands and his he was his amputeed uh amputated from his knees down wow. and not that not that he's not living a good life because dude is strong he's 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 uh he's got a great family he's got a great support system around him he's happy he's doing great things and he's not down in life but easily he could have been easily he could have had these things that were so precious to every one of us taken away from him and just went into a hole but he's strong and he didn't do that but I'm sure he's learned some things he can share with the rest of us about moderation, about living a healthier lifestyle that doesn't let your body turn on you like that. You know, he's an amazing person. Uh, he actually just opened up a, a GoFundMe uh, thing because he wants to hike or he wants to climb Kilimanjaro. I haven't heard about this. So I, uh, I actually donated to his his cause there, but I'm sure we can put a link at the bottom of the show page or whatever whatever you guys yeah. do with the yeah. links. Absolutely. Put, we can put a link to Ian's uh, thing because he's uh, one of the nicest guys I've, I've ever met. Um, completely, like, totally humble person. And um, just, yeah, you're right. He, he got this illness out of the blue for no reason it could happen. It's one of those things where it could have happened to any of us and it just happened to happen to him. Yeah. And, uh, and so he's made an amazing recovery. Um, and, and yeah, I guess he, he owns his own business. He yep. still, still codes Ruby, still codes so, iOS uh, Ruby. I don't know how, I mean, yeah, I'd love to hear Well, actually, you know what? I, I just said this the other day to, to Daniel Lauzon, who, uh, just to plug a sponsor real quick. Uh, listened to the show, got interested in TopTal. Now he freelances through TopTal, which is one of our sponsors. But I was talking to him yesterday, telling him Ian's story, and I was like, we need to have Ian on the show. So we'll, we'll make that happen. And, uh, of course, we have to let him accept our invitation. But we'll invite him, and if he comes on, <laughs> we'll t- we'll help tell his story. But yeah, strong dude, and much love for Ian. And it could happen to any of us if we don't live healthy. For sure. But yeah, I mean, like, so to get back to the the subject at hand, um, you know, we've all had those incidents where we take a shower and all of a sudden a problem that has vexed us for hours, all of a sudden the the way to fix it becomes clear, mm-hmm. uh, and that's because you're 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 sort of you're changing your pace, right? You're letting your mind go to a different place than rather than just code twenty four hours a day. Uh, it's always or, in the shower, isn't it? Yeah. Or or, 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 ideas, or overnight, right? You go to sleep and you wake up and you just have the answer. Um, so I've that, dreamt, honestly, I've dreamt about sometimes uh, solutions to things. Yeah. 
And it's like, what? How did I dream that? Like that was in my dream. That's crazy. That's the, that's the moderation, right? You, you've got to let, you got to change gears all and the eight time. Eight hours of sleep, man. Work eight, <laughs> play eight, sleep eight. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so moderation is, is not just, uh, your own habits, uh, or, or how much work you do, but it's also how you relate to others. Uh, because open source is sort of an infinite uh, time suck. And if people are just constantly peppering you with requests and questions, you will find yourself spending all of your time dealing with that. And so that's where uh, part of moderation is is being able to say no to people. Uh, it's being able to say, uh, I don't have the time to implement that feature. Um, or no, this PR is uh, is not something that I want to maintain because I have to th- I have to consider the support costs of this change, and I don't want to support it for the next you know five in years right for the length of the project. Um, and so there's a a large number of reasons why you might say no to people, and you need to consider um, that as part of moderation. You need to moderate your own time as part of a project. So we uh, will say this you are you are all here on the air because uh, Jared is so awesome and he he googles well. Jared, you're good at that, right? Thank you. That's uh, I do it for a living. <laughs> <laughs> so some would say, some would say. Uh, so it's GoFundMe dot com slash Ian Hikes I A N H I K E S Ian Hikes. Right now, his goal is six thousand dollars. The amount raised is seven twenty five. We need to push that up. We need to push that out to make this dream come true. This is, you know, I can't wait to have him on the show now. I'm excited. (laughs) But, uh, geez, man, what a goal to have. Moderation. What a good good conversation. Ian is not moderating his goals there. No, no, he is. He's leaning far into them. Hiking the trail behind my house. That's a moderate goal. Yes. Hiking Kilimanjaro. That is not a moderate goal. No, that's (laughs) that's extreme. Yeah. Sometimes, though, you know, and that's the thing, too, right, is part of moderation comes wise choices. Wisdom, I think, I I think wisdom is probably the thing that sits beneath everything we've talked about today because you can you can have moderation. That doesn't mean always playing it safe. There's times to take risks, and I'm right. sure you can attribute that, Mike, and you as mm-hmm. well, Jared. And there's times you go above and go to the extremes, like climbing, uh, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. There's times you do that. But then there's times when you when you moderate your life a little bit more and you do things that uh, allow you to have more flexibility and more, more focus in certain areas, goal setting, I think is super, super important to all these things. Yeah. But the wisdom to know when to go to the extremes or hang out in, in goal land and, uh, and keep, keep doing what you're doing there. So any closing thoughts, Mike, Jared, uh, no. say no to drugs, kids. <laughs> Of course, of course. <laughs> say say no to pull requests. No. <laughs> say, no to, say no. Say no to pull requests. Indeed, <laughs> the world's most dangerous drug. Yes. No, I mean, uh, you know, I I think moderation and and learning to say no and being realistic with what you want to do and what you want to achieve is is that part of that wisdom. Uh, it's part of the experience you get at, over being a, in being an open source developer for a number of years. You start to learn this stuff. I got something that I think might be, and you guys might like, is uh, sometimes we're our, our own worst enemies, right? And you got your buddy to your right, and you got your buddy to your left, and I learned this in the Army, right? It, you got those people around you that you can trust. And if you're someone someone trusts, so in this example, let's say uh, the three of us here, right? I'm someone you guys trust. And if I think Jared is doing something that is abusing his moderation, abusing his goals. If I know his goals and I'm there as a support person in his life because I'm close enough to him and I see him stepping out of line, help, I would say, help people that either you look up to or you know and you're close enough and you can say this to them, help them moderate their life. Help them not go too crazy. Help them realize, you know, hey, you said you're going to focus on these goals and I see you doing this, this, and this. Not saying you're doing anything wrong. You might want to just double check back to your goal list. Are you actually going towards where you're trying to go? Because sometimes I'm my worst enemy and my yeah. wife, man, if I didn't have my wife had this sometimes, <laughs> I know for sure I'd be on the ground and I just would not be who I am. 
because she knows me so well. She knows what my goals are. She knows who I'm trying to be. She knows what kind of man I'm trying to be. And, you know, if I didn't have her as a support system, if I didn't have her as her advice, I would make unwise choices all the time, every day. Yeah. So maybe as a, a call to arms for people is to is to watch out for our, our fellow developers out there, our fellow friends out there, whether right. you, you know, how close you are to them is, is your choice, but help others not go towards burnout. Don't push them to burnout. Yeah. See, if I have a closing remark, it would be uh, back to the point about a hobby versus a living. And uh, the goal setting uh, can be simplified down to, is the, am I doing this as a hobby or am I doing this as a means of making a living? And I think determining that and holding strong to it, of course, you can switch at a certain point if you want to, but knowing what it is helps you moderate because a hobby has got to be fun. It's got to be fun. It's got to be interesting and it can't consume your life. Mm-hmm. Um, now a job, sometimes you just got to do the job, right? Right. It's work. And that's why we call it that. Um, so I think that's a good way to judge, you know, this idea you have is it worth or it? this project you just started and what you're getting yourself into is how do I approach this? Is it a hobby or is it a job? And I'm going to, you know, approach it um, appropriately for each one. That's a good way of thinking about it. I think from a technical engineer's standpoint, what's fun to me is writing the code. What's yeah. not, fu- what's never fun is supporting uh, users just because, uh, you know, I don't have that problem. And so when they come to me and they, that I'm solving their problem, that's work. I'm working for them to solve their problem. Mm. And, and so you have to be very clear um, yeah. with open source, especially around support. How long are you going to support this thing? Mm. How much of an effort are you going to make support, supporting it? What channels are you going to support it through? Otherwise, it'll, just, it'll, it'll suck all the fun out of the project. Yeah. For, for example, not Twitter. I saw you tweet just yesterday as I was kind of like coming back to your timeline to prepare to see if there's anything else you, any recent, um, you know, sustainability nuggets you've shared that we should mm-hmm. pull into the conversation. And you were like, hey, I don't do support on Twitter. Go here. Right. You know, and exactly. you said it in a polite way. You know, you didn't say it as mean as I just said it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you were, you know, you made it clear. You set expectations that support yeah. doesn't happen on Twitter. Don't ask for it. It's it's a nightmare, right? 140 characters. Come on, that's not realistic. That's um, no half half of support is getting the user to define their problem. Oftentimes, when you force somebody to write out what the problem they're having is, they can solve it themselves. Yeah, like it's it's almost like rubber duck debugging, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, someone asking a question in 140 characters, I, you know, I'm going to give you a 140 character answer, which is not going to be very useful. So yeah, I, I I try to make it clear to people, uh, and and I don't I don't I'm not mean about it, but I just be matter of fact. I don't use Twitter for support. Twitter's here for you know retweeting stupid stuff and cat pictures and that sort of thing. Change all posts. Or change <laughs> yeah. all posts. Yeah, that's that's the stuff you got to retweet right there. Well, that was the stupid stuff. I'm just kidding. That was, <laughs> well, cool. Any any other closing thoughts before we trail out? No, this has been a this has been a fun show for me to have a discussion. It's not often I even get to talk this much. But it's been fun. I liked it. <laughs> Thank you for jumping on the on the subject and 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 allowing me to come on. Uh, you know, talk. actually, let me uh, let me open up Twitter real quick because there's another person we should thank uh, here on the show because they are the reason I even saw your tweet, which uh, it was Marcelo, and I don't know how you say your last name because you're from my favorite country, uh, Brazil. <laughs> Um, but Marcelo, I'm going to say that and your M A R C E L O C G on Twitter. Marcelog. Goncalves. Uh, Marcelo Goncalves. Uh, right. That's probably not right, but yeah, it's, without the, without the proper accent, you can't say that name. So I that's... won't attempt it. And I'm already, uh, known to be a bad last name butcher. I just, <laughs> there's times when I can't say, even say my own last name. I'll just say his last name is UTF-8 compatible because he's got some, that C's got some crazy there stuff you go. going on. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he retweeted your tweet, Mike, and then I was going back through at mentions for our old Twitter handle. So if you're listening to this and you're still tweeting at the changelog on, on Twitter, we've moved to at changelog because uh, it's, you know, it's shorter. Saving three characters. Saving That's three right. characters. That's right. Nice. So we did that, and but we, we check... Uh, at the changelog mentions from time to time, and 
Marcelo retweeted yours, and I was like, what is this? And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I was like, no one's responded to Mike? Hey, you've got time to more. You want to come on the show? You're like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, Johnny perfect. on the spot. Johnny on the spot. I, I like it. That's the, that's the best show is the is uh is the impromptu unexpected great shows. And Mike, you're always a great guest. This is what your third time being on the show? Third time. Third time's a charm. Yeah. Well, we'll have to make you a uh, uh, you know. I just love the gab. You know you do. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get you that smoking jacket. You've earned it. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. We'll have to send a, a t shirt. Do you have a t shirt? I I I'm wearing a t-shirt. You are, but do you have a change Does it say log the change log on it? No, I don't have a change log. Oh, we'll, we're going to correct yeah, that. We're going to send you a t-shirt. Fair enough. When we're done here, we'll get your address. We'll we'll ship you out a, an awesome, comfy tea. And if you don't have a change log tea, not to sell any, but you, you could go buy one if you wanted to. Change.com <laughs> slash store. They're only 20 bucks. I think they're 20 bucks. Has worn by like, local Ruby celebrities. That's right. That's Look. right. <laughs> Look, that's good. And they're super comfy. American Apparel. Uh some of the best shirts out there uh but anyways let's let's tell this off great I, I really did enjoy this this is so much fun so if you were listening to this and you like to see us do more discussions like this encourage us tweet at us not negatively positively <laughs> right be nice share your love uh, but with that let's say goodbye fellas bye see ya <laughs>